because Jeff is awake in very strange hours, he sees Mr. Thorough entering and leaving his his flat three or four times at like three, four in the morning. And this is what leads to the suspicion that something has happened. And after this, the curtains, the blinds of his flat are then closed. So you can't see into the flat anymore. You can't see the wife. Gives suspicion to Jeff that a murder has been committed. How about this morning? Any further developments? Uh, the shades are all drawn in the apartment. In this heat? Yeah. Well, they're up now. Okay, thank you, Ken, for joining me again. And today we're going to review the movie Rear Window. Yeah. 1954, um, uh, James Stewart, or Jimmy Stewart, seems to have two names depending upon whatever, but yeah, James was Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart. And Grace Kelly, yeah, it was, I mean, coming back from Harvey and watching another film of his, 1954, like I say, He's a photographer, a bit of a daredevil photographer, and he's been injured in some kind of crash covering a race of some kind. But it seems like he's been a war photographer, goes to dangerous places. He's living on the edge in terms of using his photography to travel the world, see the world, and cover dangerous things. And as a consequence, gets injured and is confined to... Well, confined to his room with massive plaster on one leg, which goes right up to his waist. Beautifully shot. I mean, again, this is a Hitchcock film. No, Alfred Hitchcock made many a suspense, thriller, murder type film uh, during his career uh, and quite often pops up in cameo roles, uh, which he does quite lovely in a lovely kind of way within this film. But the whole film is basic. Virtually all the film is shot from one room, looking out from the window of the room into a quadrant of housing of, of, of various flats in the middle of summer. I'm going to assume, I don't think it's ever said, it's it's New York, potentially. Um, hot, sweaty, people sleeping on balconies. Everybody's got the windows open. So during this period of time when he is incapacitated, when he's unable to walk, He's just watching out of his rear window. He's he's just observing what's going on around him, trying to get prevent himself from getting very very bored. So he's he's watching through the window. He's just observing life going by. So I mean, there's a lot of this camera movement inside of the room. It's all very static. It's all very thoughtful. It's all very conventional. But there's a the initial shot is of the camera pushing forward and going out of the window and then searching and seeing what people are doing within their own flats, within their own homes. We have uh, Little Miss um, Torso, who's a, a, a dancer, and she's parading around her room dancing. We have Little Miss Lonely Heart, who's, who's a lady who, who's desperate for love. Um, we see another couple who, like I say, were, were sleeping on the balcony and they have a dog which they lower in a basket into a garden. And then we have this guy who's a salesman who's um, arguing with his wife and we have a, a newly wed couple. So you're just getting little grasps of these people from a long lens, just going about their daily routine and you can hear a little bit of the, the sort of the ambient sounds. There's a musician who's creating scores for the something he's, he's at his piano. And we're lit with just being able to see from one window, through their window, to them living their lives. But there's a little bit more information than that. There's a little bit more to the story than that. So after my initial observations, this is the first time you've seen this film and I believe the first time you've been aware of Alfred Hitchcock so give me your opinion give me your overview take me through this film please okay so I knew about Alfred Hitchcock in the movie The Birds I haven't seen the whole thing but I've seen some of the scenes from that but I haven't watched any because I guess maybe I thought they would be like very scary and so in any case yeah the, this is the first time I've seen it 
and didn't really know what to expect when I went to watch it. It was night and my father said, Ooh, I don't know if you want to watch that. You're going to be scared. And it had some points that were suspenseful, but ultimately I didn't end up losing any sleep that night starts out. You know, we see him like sitting by the window, just sweating. And the windows open. And the thing is that it's before the time of everybody having air conditioning, New York city, hot summer. You can see the thermometer. You can see that it's over 90 and you can just see sweat pouring. And you can see that his window, he's sitting by this beautiful, like big, huge picture window. And he can see from that window into all the other people that live across the way into their windows and they all have all their blinds open their windows open because they need to get the air because it's stifling hot and so we get to see little glimpses of the all of these characters that you mentioned and that's the whole thing he's he's on his seventh week of having this cast and his employer actually calls and i have a job for you you should be getting your cast off but he's not he's got one more week jeffries congratulations jeff for what? For getting rid of that cast. Who said I was getting rid of it? This is Wednesday. Seven weeks from the day you broke your leg. Yes or no? Did I get the wrong day? No. No, wrong week. To have that cast on. And so during this time, he's really gotten to know all of the habits and all of the rituals and the daily routines of these neighbors because there's nothing else to do he's just sitting there with his leg broken and he's stuck in this room and so then you get to see the different only a few characters like you said we have this this nurse that comes in once a day and she's maybe she's giving him some sort of massage because he's not moving around or something and then you have the girlfriend and you have the detective. And those are the main characters that are coming into his apartment. But the other ones are all across the way. And you really only see them through his eyes, through his lens, through the binoculars, through the different ways that he's looking out his window. Obviously, that would be an incredibly boring film if that's all it was about. Yeah, a little bit more sinister. Because obviously, as he's observing these people, he becomes aware that potentially one of his neighbours may have committed a murder. He hasn't seen anything. It's what he hasn't seen. It's what changes from the norm, which leads him to believe that potentially a salesman who lives across the, the, the garden, the patio, the, the sort of public space for these flats and houses may have committed a murder. And he... Well, it becomes, how would you put this, it becomes obsessed, I would say, or bordering on obsessed in terms of what has happened to this woman. He's so obsessed that he even drags in his, his girlfriend, uh, who is Grace Kelly, who's called Lisa. Maybe she died. Where's the doctor? Where's the undertaker? She could be sleeping under sedatives. He's in there now. There's nothing to see. I must be said, Grace Kelly, I think, was born in Philadelphia, has the most impeccable, perfect English accent. You'd think she was English. But anyway, so he then he explains to, to Lisa what he hasn't seen, but which leads him to believe that potentially the wife or the girlfriend, the, the partner of the traveling salesman who sells costume jewelry or something may have been murdered. And initially she's she's a bit skeptical about this. And so is to some extent his nurse, who I believe is called Stella. Him and his wife splitting up? I, I just I just can't figure it. He went out several times last night in the rain carrying his sample case. Well he's a salesman, isn't he? Well what would he be selling at three o'clock in the morning? She doesn't actually come across as a nurse, she comes more across as a masseuse or something, because that's all she does to him, really. But anyway, they they all get involved or become intrigued by what has happened to the traveling salesman, the costume jewelry salesman's wife. Now I think he's called, I'm gonna to have to look at my notes, uh Thorough, Mr. Thorough. Because Jeff is awake in very strange hours, he sees Mr. Thorough entering and leaving his, his flat three or four times at like three, four in the morning. And this is what leads to the suspicion that something has happened. 
And after this, the curtains, the blinds of his flat are then closed. So you can't see into the flat anymore. You can't see the wife. Gives suspicion to Jeff that a murder has been committed. How about this morning? Any further developments? Uh, the shades are all drawn in the apartment. In this heat? Yeah. Well, they're up now. He's a traveling salesman. He, tra he sells jewelry and he's carrying the, the suitcase out. It's pouring rain and he goes out numerous times. And you do see the wife earlier in the earlier scenes. She's an invalid. So she's in another room and you see that they're quarreling. So you can see that they're not happy. And so, yeah, when he sees him going out numerous times throughout the night with this with this heavy, it looks, I guess, like it's kind of heavy. And then it comes back, he comes back and it's not as heavy. So he sees him going in and out in the rain. Like why he's not selling stuff at one and three in the morning yeah. and then wakes up later on after the rain has passed and all those blinds are closed. As you say, because he's coming in and out, that really does bring up more suspicion as to what's happened. Uh, also, Jeff spots him through, I think he threw through his camera lens, a long telephoto, spots Mr. Uh, Mr. Thorrell with a saw, some kind of heavy hand saw, and a big, I want to call it a machete, a machete-type knife, and he's wrapping it up in the kitchen sink. And then there's a scene where he brings in some rope and he kind of walks into the room, which has got the blinds down, and the next thing is, is there's a big, big suitcase, packing case, which is all wrapped up in this rope. And Let's start from the beginning again, Jeff. Tell me everything you saw. Two removal men come and take it away. Now, at this particular point, Stella, the nurse, at this particular point, both Stella and Lisa are aware of what's happening. They're aware of the suspicion of murder, etc., etc. So Stella, who happens to be uh, tending for Jeff at this particular point, runs down to try and see where the packing case, what vehicle has been put onto to sort of grab any information from the signage as to where, you know, who it belongs to and where it might be going. She misses that. So there are scenes where both Stella, Lisa and Jeff are together. And you realise that they've started to become their own little private investigation company trying to solve this murder. Now, Jeff, it's just sort of alluded to in a few sentences, Jeff, Jimmy Stewart, who actually was a World War II bomber pilot, if I remember correctly, in the film, he calls up an old friend, an old pilot friend or an old um, crew member from his, from his World War II days, who's now a detective. Uh, Mr. Doyle, Detective Doyle. Tom Doyle, I believe is what he's called. I admit it all has a mysterious sound. It could be any number of things. Murders are the least possible. Now, Doyle, don't tell me he's an unemployed magician amusing the neighborhood with his sleight of hand. Now, don't tell me that. It's too obvious and stupid way to commit murder. Full view of 50 windows. And he gets him involved, and uh, Tom does a bit of investigation, checks a few things out, comes back, and kind of goes, no, 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 you're completely mistaken. His wife's gone to the country. The, the packing case was put on a train. It's It's been picked up. The wife's there, et cetera, et cetera. So Tom's not overly convinced. Although I think initially he's suspicious and because he knows Jeff really well because of the, 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 the days during the war, he's probably, he's believing Jeff. He's not, he's not seeing Jeff as just some scatty person who's just making this up. I think he's seeing Jeff as somebody who's, some, especially as a photographer, who's incredibly observant, who's looking at things and seeing things change or not change when they should change. So he kind of gets involved in weeding out some of the information about going across to the house, about checking a few things out, talking with people he knows, talking with concierge at the at the entrance to this block of flats, this, this block of apartments. So it becomes a, we have these four main, main protagonists who we see up close and personal. Everybody else is seen from a distance. 
except at the end of the film where things change ever so fractionally. I'm going to throw this back in, into your court again. What else did you notice about our main protagonist? Anything about our main protagonist which which struck you as, as interesting, as struck you in terms of the story? I mean, they do have also the whole, you know, he has this relationship with Lisa. He he is actually at the beginning talking to Stella, his nurse, and says, I don't want to marry her. She wants to marry me. We're complete opposites. Basically, she's this high-class woman. She wears all like this expensive clothing. She works at a magazine. She's got like a really good job, but she's a high class. She she alludes that she lives in like the upper part, the like the high class part of New York City, and that she has a completely different lifestyle. She's not going to want to travel the world and go to all these dangerous places. You see, the first time they get together, they they kind of quarrel over this because he says, "Well, you know, why can't things just stay the same?" She obviously wants to get married, and she thinks she can go. And have this lifestyle, but he's like, no, you can't. You're just like, you're, you know, wearing these expensive dresses and eating all this fancy food and like this can't work. Well, if there's one thing I know, it's how to wear the proper clothes. Yeah, yeah. Well, try and find a raincoat in Brazil, even when it isn't raining. Lisa, in this job, you carry one suitcase. Your home is the available transportation. Then I think once she starts to get into the whole detective thing she's they start to work together and i think he starts to almost see that maybe they could be a couple and they could go on these journeys together but it isn't until like before she's just all wearing all her fancy dresses and eating the fancy food but once she all she like at one point she hears a story and she's like no you're, you you need to get some sleep let's close the windows but she she ends up looking and she sees i think she sees that the trunk is all tied up with rope yeah. and she sees the bed. The bed is like all like the mattress is folded over and there's a big case on it. And she then says, tell me everything from where it started. And that's yeah. where she starts to get into the whole being a detective with Jeff. Well, I mean, yes, obviously she's using a little bit of woman's intuition. She's going, well, a woman wouldn't leave her handbag at the end of the bed. A woman wouldn't wrap all of her jewelry and her wedding ring and her expensive jewelry into a handbag. She, they wouldn't do that. A woman wouldn't just leave without taking the most essential things if she was going unless she was going for an hour. So she starts to use her the logic about being a woman and, and the experiences of a woman as to why things are wrong. So she's picking out the errors of this situation, the error, the, you know, the things which to her do not seem right with with what's happening in the room across the way and, and how Mr. Thurl is dealing with things. It's and there is this there is a, a scene where Mr. Thurl is on the phone. He dials three numbers and Jeff says something about the fact he's dialing long distance. I mean obviously this must have been the way you did it in 1954. But obviously he's on the phone and he's talking about this jewelry to somebody or he's talking to somebody whilst handling the jewelry. And suppositions are made that that he's talking to somebody somewhere else about the the, the value of this jewelry, et cetera, et cetera. It's just it's a way of just building the the plot as to why he would have his wife's jewelry. The only way he would really have his wife's jewelry is if he if she was dead and he'd taken the wedding ring off her finger and and stuff like that. Um, and you, you're you're right, Lisa does start to work with him. And in a very sort of proactive kind of way, because obviously Jeff is incapacitated, he can't move around. Jeff's suspicions lead him to uh, take the upper hand on this one, to, to take sorry, to take the initiative in terms of trying to find out more. And um, he writes a very basic note, what have you done with your wife? It's quite a nice shot, because it's actually shot from above, and it just creeps in and creeps in and creeps in until the letter's written and the letter's folded, and it's, it's put in an envelope. Um, uh, and Lisa takes it across and, and delivers it to Mr. Thurl's apartment. He, there's then a situation where this, obviously, Mr. Thurl is like, whoa, what's going on here? Because he knows, he knows people know what's happened. There's another situation a little later where Jeff rings him up and says, we need to meet. We need to meet. I'm at a bar down the street, we need to meet, I'll, I'll see you in 10 minutes. So Mr. Thurl goes off. This gives both Lisa and Stella the opportunity to go down and to, to check out what's been happening. Backtracking slightly, there's a dog involved. There's a 
this dog running around the garden and this dog starts digging in a flower bed. It, it happened several times and nothing's really noted about it, but at some particular point, Jeff asks, I can't remember whether it's Lisa or Estella, to bring across uh, some, some slides, being a photographer, he's, he's been taking photographs, just trying to pass the time of day. And he has a picture, which he looks, slides are a, they're not a print, they're a, they're a sort of real life, how do, what, how do you describe a slide? It was a. It was uh, a negative was, that you could see. You could. It's a positive. It was a positive, it's a positive so, that you could put light through and have the picture, not yeah, like yeah, Google yeah. Slides or Microsoft mm, Slides, but the no. old fashioned slides that you could put your picture on a wall or a projector. That's oh my God, we're, we're we're going back a few years, but yes, you could project them on a wall. For everyone well, in this case, you just had. Remember those. <laughs> but those. <laughs> but those are a lot younger than me. A little machine which you just look through and you use light to see the picture that you've taken. And it's a picture of the, the flower bed. And he notices that some of the flowers are lower after two weeks growing than, than they would be. So it just adds to the suspicion. Anyway, we have another protagonist in this film who, who, who's non-human. It's a little dog who gets winched up and down from one of the top floor flats to run around the gardens. And he, great. Um, it becomes quite suspicious or is sniffing around the the flower bed. Obviously, he can, he can smell something. But later on in the film, the dog is found dead. And it's only at this point that we, we basically exit Jeff's room and we, we enter the courtyard to some extent, mostly on still long shots, but closer long shots, if that makes any, if that makes any sense. But there are two tight images, there are two close-ups, probably the same size as the picture you're looking at, myself and Michelle at the moment, where we see, I think it's uh, Little Miss Physique and uh, Miss Lonely Hearts, where we see them quite close, which was quite, it, it's quite a radical kind of change in the way people are, the, the other neighbours are seen in this particular film, because at that particular point, everybody's been from a distance. We've seen people, you know, fighting and people moving around the house and dancing and trying, you know, and having parties and playing songs. So it's just the one occasion within this film when we exit Jeff's room and we enter the other realm of the other protagonists who we've always only seen from a distance. And I think that part happens very soon after Doyle had visited with Lisa and Jeff and kind of said, oh, this is why it wasn't a murder. Every, there's an explanation of everything. There was a postcard. There's this, that. Mm -hmm. And Lisa and Jeff are almost disappointed that there wasn't a murder. And they kind of like are, they, they feel kind of guilty that they're disappointed that there wasn't a murder. And Lisa then pulls down the blinds and they're like, they're going to go to sleep. She's actually going to spend the night that night there. And then all of a sudden you hear a scream. And they pull up yeah. the blinds and then you see all this close up. And then that's when Jeff said the only person, the only person that did not come to their window mm. is Thorwald. He's in, you can see his window dark and you can just see like, I think he's smoking a cigar, but he's yeah. the only person that when that scream happened and when the owner of the dog is like screaming, how could you kill this dog? Like I thought we're neighbors and all this. And he was just a little dog that made people happy. He was the only person that didn't come to his window. Yeah. All the other neighbors dead. Yeah. Running forward slightly, both Stella and Lisa go down into the garden area with a shovel, with a spade, digging up the hole. Lisa decides to become incredibly brave, climbs up a fire exit. Lisa, what are you doing? Don't go... into Mr. Thurwood's room, hunting for evidence, looking for this handbag with the jewellery. Mr. Thurwood returns, finds her in his room with the jewellery. Jeff, he rings the police, saying that a woman is being attacked in the room opposite. They turn up and save the day by actually rescuing Lisa 
but probably arresting her. But at this particular point, she you can see her quite clearly through the window, and she has the wedding ring on of the late Mrs. Thurl. And but Mr. Thurl clocks the fact that the ring is on her finger and clocks the fact that somebody may be looking from the opposite window. So she gets arrested. Uh, obviously, um, his friend who's in the police force is also kind of involved because telephone conversations are happening and messages are being left. And, you know, we're in this situation where now Mr. Thurl is aware that the person who left the message, the person who ran, lives potentially in one of the rooms, in one of the flats opposite his, and decides to take things into his own hands. And I'm going to throw this into your court now to explain a little bit more, give us a little bit more detail as to, as to what's going to be happening next. Yeah, so in the scene that you mentioned where Lisa is in, I think it's Thor Thoreau's apartment, the police are there. She actually, she, she has her hand behind her back and she has the ring on and she kind of is pointing to it. And you see Lars Thoreau look and see, and he actually looks across and they, at Jeff and Stella there, and like, step back, he saw us. Look, the wedding ring. Turn off the light, he's seen us. And so that point, Lisa gets arrested and he calls Doyle's um, and says, okay, this is what's happened. Lisa's arrested. This is all that's happened. And hang up it says Doyle's is going to get involved and, and, and go to the police yeah. station and all that. So the phone rings, he picks mm. up the phone. He says, he thinks it's Doyle. He says, I think he, he think he knows he turns out the lights, but the phone is silenced. There's nothing. And he realizes it's the killer. So he hangs up and he realizes he's coming. So he's looking around the room and he starts to hear, he starts to hear footsteps because he's on the second floor. He starts to feel footsteps going up the stairs and he looks around, what can I do? Like I'm in a wheelchair, I can't really get out of here. I can't really defend myself very easily. But being a photographer, he looks around and he sees that he's got these flash bulbs. Now these are, you know, before you and my time mostly, I think. But basically you- when Just, you just. <laughs> When you took a picture in the dark at that time, you could just use one flash bulb one time, right? And it would make, yep. you know, inside anywhere. If you didn't have a flash bulb, you took a picture inside, it wasn't coming out. So you had these flash bulbs and they were one time use. So he took it and he decided when the door was going to open, he's going to flash and he would cover his eyes and he's going to flash um, one of these bulbs and try to blind the killer. And so he keeps on doing that. And the killer would stumble and kind of like get blinded. And then he'd come a couple of steps forward and he'd do it again. So he did that like three or four times to the point that he had no more flash bulbs left and the killer gets mm -hmm. to him. And when he finally gets to him, he's then trying to kill him and trying to push him out of the window. But he, Jeff turns and he looks and he sees that Stella and Lisa and the police are across the way and he yells out for help. And that's when somehow people get across the way really quickly to his apartment and they're starting to try to get to him and save him before they can save him. He's just hanging on to the window ledge and somehow some other police must have came below him and he falls down. Jeff is in the dark, so obviously they all can't see him. And he has this discussion, which is like, I haven't got any money. What, why, what do you want from me? I've got no money. And he mm -hmm. says, why, why did the girl not turn me in when the police came? What do you want? I like, just like, why, what do you want? And Jeff says nothing. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's a, there's a fight sequence or there's a, there's a scuffle sequence. Cause obviously Jeff can't fight. Jeff's got one leg. Jeff's in a plaster. Jeff's in no position to defend himself. They have this fight. They have this thing, this physical altercation. <laughs> He's trying to throw him out of the window. And as you say, eventually Jeff falls and is being caught or is caught by, or his fall is broken by the police or he lands on the floor and, and Stella comes to give him some assistance because she's a nurse. 
I mean, at this particular point, the film kind of reverts back to this, I think like, well, it doesn't revert because obviously it's a 1954 film, but those police dramas of the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, where it's all explained at the end, it kind of happens. And it was the one bit of the film which for me was like, oh, oh because what happens is, you know, a policeman leans out of the window and basically says, oh, yeah, Mr. Thurl's basically admitted to the murder. His wife's scattered all over New York. And this it just happens instantly. And I'm quickly. thinking, in real life, this isn't going to happen like this. But, you know, it's... this That little sequence at the end is is a, is a for me, is the, the warm piece of the film which, which lets it down. And people running around are sped up. It's actually, it's yeah. they've sped up the, the, the rain. And it just looks odd. They got, they got now, to his apartment way too quickly. Like he looks out the window and he yells for help and they somehow get from the other side. It's a big loop to get to him. The people have got to exit through the front of that other building and then run around both buildings, I guess, or somehow and get yeah. to the stairs and run up. So how, they couldn't have done it that quickly. No, but it, 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 yeah, it was the one little bit of the film which was like, oh, it's 1954. Films were different. Films were different. That's all I'm going to say. The murderer confesses off camera. A policeman comes out of a window and basically lets us know what has happened. The fact that the theories that the nurse, uh, Stella, the nurse had about the body being chopped up and spread around New York are in fact correct. Kind of going back to Stella, she's quite a gory kind of person. There's a little scene where she's she's kind of pontificating as to what's happened whilst Jack is having breakfast. Just where do you suppose he cut her up? Of course, the bathtub. That's the only place where he could have washed away the blood. And he's like going, oh, I don't think I want to eat this bacon. <laughs> but I ha you, know, you have to look at a film which is from 1954. You can't look at this film for today's perspective as to how, how the final part of the plot was revealed within the film. As a film for an English learner, I think it's great because again, it's very clear English. There's very little music in it except background music or the pianist playing. So the, none, of the, none of the dialogue is really overly laid with anything in particular, the street noise. But again, it's not, it's quite subtle. It's not in your face. It's not masking the dialogue. So as a, as a film for, for non-natives of English, I think it's a great film because there's a lot of great dialogue. There's some great one-liners, there's, there's some great dialogue between the main protagonists all the way through this film. So it's, it's, just, it's just a really nice thing. It's a very nice film. It's about one one hour 45 minutes i think in total so absolutely worth looking at as a, as a film so i mean again looking at it as a if you were an english learner what's your thoughts on that yeah i do agree i think the older movies are like you said they don't have all the overlays of too much sound too much music over like so many parts of the movie they're slower paced this one being just like all in one room mm -hmm. it's not overly complicated it's all one room looking into other other rooms and you get to kind of get to know the different characters but that keeping it very simple almost like a play where you're kind of just like you got the one set so I do think that would make it easier I think obviously they probably speak slower than people do today and so that would definitely be a plus for people that are learning English. I also wanted to point out something I didn't really realize until just reading a little bit about the film after the fact is that the murderer, the killer, Lars Thorwald, I didn't realize he's Raymond Burr, I believe, who is um, Ironside. Perry Mason. And all the Perry Ooh, Mason movies. I thought he was Ironside. There's a TV series called Ironside, I remember rightly. Oh, no. It's... um. But yes, I, I mean, instantly I saw his face. I thought, yes, he's a... He's a detective. He was one. He was the detective in the wheelchair. Yeah, I thought it was called Lions. Oh yeah, I know that. Um, I used to love the Perry Mason movies, so I didn't realize because I didn't really like. You see, you don't really see him up close any time in the movies, and I think it was way before that he. It was yeah. obviously 1950, and I think the Perry Mason movies were like the last ones were me being made in the 90s. Ah, I wonder whether Perry Mason and Ironside are two different titles for the same program. Because in the UK, it was called Ironside, from what I remember. He was in a wheelchair, detective in a wheelchair. Again, from the sort of 
I want to say this mid seventies, eighties, right? Maybe yeah, a bit more long, long running American series, which was shown in the UK as well. Fairly standard detective series, him being in a wheelchair. But yeah, I, I spotted him straight away. I thought, oh, which is quite. I mean, when you watch a lot of these films from that far back, you will see actors who then gained their own notoriety, their own fame, who were almost bit part actors in these programs, in these in these films yeah. initially. Uh, and uh, but yeah, you spotted that one as well. And and, I and I just, just a quick like Google immediately says rear v- window. Like 1998, I believe, was a remake with Christopher Reeves. Christopher Reeves. I didn't yeah. see it. I was like, oh, if I had known, uh-huh. maybe I would have tried to watch it before our conversation. But I think at the time, it was after he had the unfortunate accident. So he was wheelchair bound. Uh-huh. So for him to play that part, it was already wheelchair bound. Oh. Part. Yeah. Okay. I was I, I was aware there was a remake. I'm always, oh. I'm always skeptical of remakes of really good films because they very rarely live up to the original. I was aware that he made a film or there was a remake and it was with, with Chris Reed. But yes, he was involved in a terrible horse riding accident and, and was paraplegic, I think, afterwards. Yeah. What's the next film? What, what's next on the list? Well, I was thinking to do something a little different from this. I was thinking of the movie Lean on Me with Morgan Lean. Freeman. Have you heard of that one? It's a high school and it's about a high school in New Jersey that's doing like really, really bad. There's a lot of like crime in the neighborhood and the school is about to go into what's called receivership, which means that it's going to be taken over by the state unless they can get all their scores up to a C grade or a passing grade. Right. So they need to get their basic scores up to a C grade. And so they hire this principal played by Morgan Freeman. It's actually based on a true story. And so I thought maybe we could do that. We've done some other, we did the other movie, Gregory's Girl, that was based on high school. Yeah. Kind of earlier. Okay. This one is like 1989. I think the story is from the 80s. Brilliant. Sounds like a good one. I'm going to have to eBay that one. So that's my next, that's my next task, eBay. All right. I'm always skeptical. <laughs> Don't even put that in. 